Merkaba Part 1 Chariots of Fire Chariots of Fire, Earthly and Heavenly, Part 1 The Merkaba By Lois I. Roden Copyright, May 22, 1983 All rights reserved Brackets theirs unless otherwise indicated Printed by Mike's Print Shop, 2507 Grim Waco Texas 76707, phone 817-752-2321, for Living Waters Branch, P.O. Box 4666, Waco, Texas 76705, phone 817-863-5325. Special Report, the Merkava Tank, Israel's War Chariot. The most formidable war machine in existence today is an Israeli tank called the Merkava. The name, taken from the divine war chariot seen by Ezekiel, Habakkuk, and Isaiah, denotes the superpowers invested in the high-technology machine. It is powered by a 20mm projector, which is more than a bullet. It seeks petroleum, especially diesel, but is also sensitive to jet fuel. Each bullet has its own sensing system that sets into the fuel tank on a tanker's field, penetrates the tank, destroys all personnel, and at the same time a capsule that furnishes oxygen for the explosion converts the fuel into a fire extinguisher inside the tank. The tank can then be repaired, cleaned up, and made ready for reuse. During the Syrian-Israeli war, an eyewitness saw an amazing incident. Quote, we were set up for a tank trap for 800 tanks. Afterward, we had destroyed or captured 2,800 tanks. In 1973, there were more tanks per tank in the Golan Heights than in all the wars combined. Same thing in Sinai, the amount of Russian equipment poured in for the destruction of Israel. They did not destroy them for their tanks were helpless. Israel knocked out all the tanks. The Israelis had to come up the coastal area first. They were able not only to penetrate, but to airlift 100 Merkava tanks and cut off the Beirut-Damascus road. Tanks cut off the Syrian and PLO. Tanks put as pinchers went in and cut all the armies to pieces. The Syrians called for a ceasefire. Once they had a ceasefire, a week or five to six days later, the Syrians came back over the Lebanese mountains, Herman Range with about 80, plus or minus a few, of the most sophisticated tanks, T-72, invincible tank line, a combine. These 80 tanks were knocked out in one second, one explosion, and it sounded like the gong of a big bell. After, I could see the metal, the steel, being torn apart. The Israelis opened the tanks wide open right where they were supposed to be invincible. The Merkava tank, a mobile defense device. Either it's the only tank of the future or... End quote. 80 tanks annihilated in one second. The Israelis flew a drone plane. The drone plane, loaded with electronic equipment capable of detonating, picking up, and transmitting every electronic code in the missile, transmits back to the plane, takes information, puts it in computer, transmitting on a very high frequency in a six mile radius, is able to turn and fire the missile through the entire program in a microsecond. The drone plane, destruct plane, can put out the missiles in silos, etc. Russian missiles promoted technology from US F-16. It's not the plane, it's the pilot. They've got the best pilots in the world. They can even detonate a missile in your own backyard if armed to fire, if set up to fire. If not set up to fire, it's not a weapon. What the Israelis have developed in their Merkava tank. They have a system in the tank that can sense a heat sensing scope that can pick up the light of a cigarette five miles away. First of all, the tank system comes in, and three of the tanks are coordinating tanks that are manipulated into such a position that there is a certain place on the tank that forms a perfect triangle between two other tanks. In other words, they set up a perfect triangle. Then they put up a special antenna, and when the Telstar comes over the first time, 
they established their absolute azimuth on the face of the earth. True triangulation. When that goes into the computer, they transmit it to all the tanks in the unit. For instance, they have 300 tanks. From that moment, every tank knows its exact location on the battlefield. The computer is continually changing its orientation and position. People who have not been in the military do not know how to appreciate true azimuth. But with the true azimuth, you could shoot a gun here and three miles away, if you had that range of a gun, you could put the bullet down the barrel of another gun of the same caliber. That's absolute azimuth. The Israelis have the capacity to call up on a screen in the tank from satellites, which they have access to, the entire military picture out there. What's going on is transmitted directly into that tank as well as at headquarters. Once they get the position, they can see their guns, which will monitor that object wherever it moves. An end to PLO terrorism. Heat sensor. When the PLO starts shooting out of a room, this instrument they have developed picks up the heat source and puts it into the computer, which in turn puts it into the entire tank system. However many you have in a unit, all tanks are oriented into that program. Once this is set up for the gunner, his gun is automatic. The computer puts his gun exactly on the farthest object, the farthest one back, and every tank is assigned a window. The gunner has a special scope then that he looks through, an electronic binocular that can pull him up three miles away if he's standing looking in the window. So he has to identify whether there are terrorists in the room or not. Once he has confirmed that it is a terrorist fire, he hits the firing mechanism and the gun fires. The binocular stays on that position. He watches. When it comes off to recoil, it's ready on in its next position. The projector goes into the room, exploding, putting out small fragments of shrapnel ricocheting all over the room simultaneously with a napalm explosion. Twelve seconds later, again, a fire extinguisher is ignited and puts it out. People are living on a floor above and a floor below, and people are still living in the adjoining rooms. Terrorism as we have known it is a thing of the past with this system in operation. All the tanks are air-conditioned. The story of the Merkava tank demonstrates the power that has been unleashed upon those whose aim is the destruction of Israel. Yet it is but a dim reflection of the divine power inherent in the war chariot of God shown to Ezekiel and Isaiah, the traveling throne of the majesty of heaven, the Merkava. The message heard from this chariot was for a rebellious and disobedient people whom God wished to deliver but whose stubbornness was their undoing. They were too proud to hear and were taken captive by their enemies. Isaiah saw a great forsaking in the midst of the land, a great destruction with only a remnant left to return and rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. So it is today. The temple lies in ruins, with only a small remnant willing to return and restore the old waste places, raise up the foundations, desolate for many generations, and repair the breach in the walls. God's assurance to Isaiah was, Yet a tenth, the holy seed, shall return. The most sacred object of the temple service concerns the Ark of the Covenant, the sacred chest containing the Ten Commandments written on two tables of stone. Finding this sacred artifact would be the motivating factor to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Recent reports from several different sources over the world verifying the imminent bringing forth of the Ark of the Covenant from its secret hiding place has caused great excitement in secular and religious circles. Quote, A tradition preserved in the apocryphal book of Maccabees states that shortly before the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem in 587 BC, the prophet Jeremiah hid the Ark of the Covenant in a cave on Mount Nebo the mountain east of the Jordan River from which Moses had viewed the Promised Land. Jeremiah blocked the entrance to the cave and prophesied that the place shall remain unknown until God finally gathers his people together. 2 Maccabees chapter 2 verse 7 End quote. Biblical Archaeology Review May-June 1983 
page 66 and 67. Quote, Why I believe the golden ark is on Mount Nebo. I believe that the golden ark of the covenant, the world's greatest and most valuable antique relic of all history, has been trailed to its lair in my two years recent research work in the Holy Land, trailed to its last hiding place on Mount Nebo where Jeremiah hid it about 2,544 years ago. In verification of this, I offer both the historic as well as prophetic data. I have collected convincing evidence enough to make it hard not to believe that the Ark will return again to Old Jerusalem. The return of Ark would stagger the world, may change the belief of millions of people of all nations for the better, be the greatest blow skeptics ever received, and perhaps be the greatest modern proof of the authenticity of Holy Writ. The tablets of Sinai written about 3,525 years ago now in the ark may bring to this whole world a feeling akin to Belshazzar, king of Babylon, on the night when he too saw God's handwriting upon the walls of that famous city before its consummation, which made the king and all his nobles tremble with fear when that terrible warning, Thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting, stared them in the face. End quote. By Antonio F. Futterer an excerpt from Palestine Speaks, 1931, page 536 to 537, as quoted in Biblical Archaeology Review, May-June 1983, page 67. In October 1981, Tom Croster claimed to have actually discovered the Ark of the Covenant and to have photographed evidence for verification. He failed to ask the Jordanian Department of Antiquities for a permit to make excavation of the site, and as a result, the government abruptly cancelled all further work in the area. It is common knowledge that the Jordanians do not want any biblical discoveries made in Jordan, especially since the Israeli invasion and occupation of southern Lebanon. This factor may also reflect the reason for a continuing presence of Israel in the area and may culminate in bringing forth the Ark by those originally entrusted with its sacred presence. The Merkaba throne of divine presence, the holy Shekinah glory. The Merkava tank. Merkava main battle tank, 1978. The Merkava represents the latest thinking in tank design, suitably modified for the peculiar needs of Israel. The Merkava is in fact a defensive tank, meant for fighting from prepared positions, and for this reason much emphasis is placed on protection. The engine and transmission are in the front, and the turret is narrow and low. The crew have a large compartment at the rear which is suitable for resting or for carrying men and ammunition if necessary. There is a large stock of ammunition for the main gun, and the present power-weight ratio is quite low indicating that the designers did not envision a need for rapid movement or agility. The turret has a mantlet that will allow a larger gun to be fitted at a later date, and a more powerful engine can be accommodated easily. Preface The Bible is virtually silent on the sixth chapter of Isaiah, and no mention of the significance of the shiny seraphim is given in any other part of the scripture. Clearly, a student of the Bible would conclude that God had a purpose in revealing this wonderful vision of his ancient prophet who is fittingly called the Gospel Prophet. Many other prophecies uttered by Isaiah have been shown to have their latter-day antitypical fulfillment. The prophecy of Isaiah chapter 4 verses 1 and 2 has a latter-day application, but no precedent in history when seven women, all religions, will gladly accept the name of the Messiah whose name is Branch, the Sprout of Jehovah, Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6, chapter 33, verses 15 and 16, Zechariah 8, verse 8 and 12, and Luke chapter 1, verse 18. In verse 2, the fruit of the earth answers to Branch, not a dry, but a fruit-bearing branch. It is easily understood from Jeremiah 33, verses 15 and 16, that it would be the branch she, the Lord our righteousness, who would bear the fruit, Revelation 22, 2, as it is the mother that brings forth the children. If, as proposed by the author, Isaiah's vision has a latter-day fulfillment, 
then someone would of necessity have a similar vision clarifying the truths to be known in the original and in the present day application. In researching material on the subject of Isaiah 6, the author has uncovered articles by writers in the 1800s, 1930s, and as late as 1955, all of which provide interesting clarifications on some points, but not enough to complete the full picture of the vision. In an effort to further clear the subject, the author has combined previous findings with a personal experience and additional points for an explanation of Isaiah's vision. The personal experience had to do with a vision of a shining silver angel come down from heaven to the window of the room where the author was studying the 18th chapter of the book of Revelation, about a mighty angel who is to lighten the earth with the glory of God. To the astonishment of the author, the mighty angel had a feminine form, and her presence was felt inside the room. She was in the foreground of a scene showing thousands of feathered, silvery-winged angels moving about swiftly. This pictorial revelation came as a comforting experience to the author in the controversy in which she was involved with some of her congregation over the doctrinal studies involving the feminine gender of the Holy Spirit. With the aid of the scholars, both secular and religious, Hebrew and Christian, archaeological finds and personal research, the author has compiled several booklets on the subject. As editor of Shekinah magazine, she has made all the findings available free of charge to people in 52 countries besides colleges and libraries, as well as to the religious and secular conventions in the United States. Publication of Shekinah magazine is temporarily delayed because of a fire destroying the publishing department but plans are underway for a new building and equipment to increase the volume of all the publications. Introduction Quote, Merkaba, literally, chariot. The heavenly throne, hence, Maasa Merkaba. The lore concerning the heavenly throne chariot with a special reference to Ezekiel 1 and 10. The conception of YHWH riding upon cherubim or fiery cloudbirds upon the heavens or the clouds is certainly genuinely Hebrew. See Psalm 18, verse 10. And he rode upon the cherub and did fly, yes, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 26. There is none like unto the God of Jeshurun, who rideth upon the heaven in thy help, and in his excellently on the sky. Psalm 68, verse 4. Sing unto God, sing praises to his name, extol him that rideth upon the heavens by his name Jah, and rejoice before him. Isaiah 19, verse 1, The burden of Egypt, behold, the Lord rideth upon a swift cloud, and shall come unto Egypt, and the idols of Egypt shall be moved at his presence, and the heart of Egypt shall melt in the midst of it. Hence his war chariot. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 8, was the Lord displeased against the rivers? Was thine anger against the rivers? Was thy wrath against the sea, that thou dost ride upon thine horses and thy chariots of salvation? And Isaiah 66, verse 15, Hebrew, For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind, to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. And the name chariot for the ark with the cherubim, 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 18, and for the altar of incense refined by gold by weight, and gold for the pattern of the chariot of the cherubims, that spread out their wings and covered the ark of the covenant of the Lord. So did the prophet Ezekiel in his vision see YHWH riding on the throne chariot when leaving the doomed temple at Jerusalem. To a later age, Ezekiel's picture became a sacred mystery known by the term Merkaba. The ancient Mishnah lays down the rule. The Maase Merkaba should not be taught to anyone except he be wise and able to deduce knowledge through wisdom, gnosis, of his own. Haggai chapter 2 verse 1. Job beheld the throne of God, and his daughter sang the doxology of the Maase Merkaba. Telling the secrets of the Merkaba ceases. Telling the secrets of the Merkaba causes the Shekinah to dwell with us and the angels to accompany us. Enter the banquet hall and take your seats with your disciples and disciples' disciples among the elect, the highest. 
In the future, Ezekiel will come again and unlock for Israel the chambers of the Merkaba. Cant R I 4. Besides the descriptions of the seven heavens with their hosts of angels, and the various storehouses of the world, and of the divine throne above the highest heaven, the most remarkable feature is that the mysteries rest on the belief in the reality of the things seen in an ecstatic state brought about by ablutions, fasts, fervent invocations, incantations, and by other means. This is called the vision of the Merkaba, Zaviyat ha Merkaba. And those under this strange hallucination who imagine themselves entering the heavenly chariot and floating through the air are called Yorid Merkaba. In this chariot they are supposed to ascend to the heavens, where in dazzling light surrounding them they behold the innermost secrets of all persons and things, otherwise impenetrable and invisible. Particularly significant is the warrior nature of the angels surrounding the throne chariot. Flames dart forth from their eyes, they ride upon fiery horses, and are armed with weapons of fire. In order to be allowed to pass these terrible beings, the Merkaba rider must provide himself with amulets or seals containing mysterious names, and in order to be able to step before the throne, he must recite certain prayers until God himself addresses him, if he be worthy. The Merkaba riders have the seeing of the Lord on high as their goal. Otherwise, there is the same hallucination at work which makes the ecstatic imagine that he is lifted up from the earth to heaven to see the sun, stars, and winds come forth from their places, to hold the sun, or sun god, and the entire celestial household, the seven rulers of the celestial poles, or the archangels. The Lord reigneth, let the people tremble, he sitteth between the cherubims, let the earth be moved. Psalm 99 verse 1 who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind. Psalm 104 verse 3. The chariots of God are twenty thousand, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them, as in Sinai, in the holy place. Psalm 68 verse 17. End quote. The Jewish Encyclopedia, page 498 to 500. Italicized scriptures in brackets, ours. Quote, and for the altar of incense, refined gold by weight, and gold for the pattern of the chariot of the cherubims, that spread out their wings and covered the ark of the covenant of the Lord. End quote. First Chronicles chapter 28, verse 18. Chariots of fire, the Merkaba. Isaiah chapter 6 verses 1 to 13, Psalm 68 verse 17. A heavenly chariot visited earth with a message of comfort to Isaiah. Uzziah, the king of Judah, had died after a prosperous reign of more than 50 years, and the nation was seeking direction for the future. In this time of great national crisis in the kingdom of Judah, a young man by the name of Isaiah was called to the prophetic office. 740 B.C. While in the temple one day, Isaiah was comforted by a vision of the Merkava chariot hovering high above the sanctuary as the shining seraphim sang, quote, Holy, 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 Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. The posts of the door were moved at the voice of them that called, and the house was filled with smoke, end quote. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 2 and 3, Hebrew version. Isaiah's one and only vision was considered blasphemous, seeing God, and the divine presence was not allowed. According to tradition, his testimony was used as a reason for sawing him asunder during the reign of Manasseh. The Lord, Adonai, verse 1, Jehovah, verse 5, and the Holy Ghost, verse 10, imply a trinity if the application of John and Paul are taken into consideration. John, chapter 12, verse 1, attributes the words of Isaiah to the Messiah in verse 10, while in Acts, chapter 28, verses 25 to 26, Paul attributes the same verse to the Holy Ghost as speaking. The seraphim seem to be saying three persons, Holy, 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 Lords of Hosts. Verse 8 carries the same thought in saying, Who will go for us? 
The same plurality of majesty is expressed in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 27. Quote, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. End quote. The Hebrew word for God, Elohim, shows the us of Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Elohim, plural, at least two persons, male and female, made their images, Adam and Eve. Quote, This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam, in the day when they were created. End quote. Genesis chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Two images of God, two Adams were made, a male and a female. Adam and Eve, the first of the first fruits of God's likeness in the creation, were earthly representatives of the heavenly beings who visited them daily in the Garden of Eden, until the entrance of sin, whereupon they were expelled and lost their face-to-face -face communication with their makers. The same creators, male and female, who made their visible images in Adam and Eve, appeared to Isaiah with a promise of the restoration, recreation of Israel, their firstborn of earth, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 13. The throne of the Lord, seen by Isaiah, was a train retinue, and as it entered into the temple, quote, the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that crieth, and the house was filled with smoke, the Shekinah glory. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 and 4, end quote. It was, therefore, a traveling throne. Likewise, the train, the skirts thereof, margin, is an integral part, very precious to the Lord, and as such symbolizes his wife. A train, skirts, is associated with a wedding gown and a retinue of attendants. The skirt, spoken of in this verse, has the same meaning as in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 30. Quote, A man shall not take his father's wife, nor discover his father's skirt. End quote. Quote, Cursed be he that lieth with his father's wife, because he uncovereth his father's skirt. End quote. Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 20. Isaiah did not actually mention the form of the Lord, Elohim, plural in Hebrew. Only the train, the temple, and the shining seraphim. What he saw was not the usual description of the Shekinah, the divine presence, over the mercy seat in the sanctuary. This was a being, with a flowing robe sitting upon the throne high and lifted up. Conclusively, then, the Lord and his train, skirts, margin, represent two heavenly beings, the Messiah and the Shekinah glory, Holy Spirit. Quote, the woman is the glory of the man, end quote. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 7. Likewise, the glory of God is the heavenly woman, Holy Spirit. Quote, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars, end quote. Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. Quote, Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem, and to pray before the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, the Messiah, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. End quote. Zechariah chapter 8, verses 22 and 23. In this instance, they do not take hold of him that is a Jew, but of the skirt, the complete covering of the Holy Spirit symbolized as God's wife. The ten men out of all languages of the nations take hold of the skirt, wife, of him that is a Jew. In Isaiah chapter 4, verses 1, 2, and 5, seven women, all the churches, take hold of one man, the Jewish Messiah. Quote, in that day shall the branch, wife, of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, 
and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. And the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion, and upon her assemblies, a cloud of smoke by day, and the shining of a flaming fire by night. For upon all the glory shall be a defense. End quote. Isaiah chapter 4, verses 2 and 5. These verses point to a time when all may legitimately take hold of his skirt, wife, church, and go with her, for she is going to the promised land, back home to her dwelling place in Jerusalem, the dwelling place of the Shekinah glory. Quote, Before she, Zion, travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. End quote. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 7. Quote, Zion, Jerusalem, is the mother, and the verse describes the swift increase in her population through the reinforcement of faithful children from all parts. God is our mother. End quote. The Pentateuch and Half Torahs, Hebrew text, English translation and commentary, page 945 and 946. Quote, but Jerusalem, which is above in heaven, is free, which is the mother of us all. End quote. Galatians chapter 4, verse 26. Quote, Rejoice ye with Jerusalem, and be glad with her, all ye that love her. Rejoice for joy with her, all ye that mourn for her, that ye may suck and be satisfied with the breasts of her consultations, that ye may milk out and be delighted with the abundance of her glory. As one whom his mother comforteth, so will I comfort you, and ye shall be comforted in Jerusalem. End quote. Isaiah chapter 66, verses 10, 11, and 13. Quote, I have long time holding my peace. I have been still and refrained myself. Now will I cry like a travailing woman. I will destroy and devour at once. End quote. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 14. A close inspection of the whole book of Isaiah reveals that the majority of what he has to say is about mother, Israel, Zion, Jerusalem, according to Galatians chapter 4, verse 26, is the mother of us all. Hagar, the Jewish church, represented the earthly Jerusalem, mother of Israel. Sarah represented the heavenly Jerusalem, which is above and free, Galatians chapter 4, verses 22 to 31. The rabbis speak of the wife, mother, as the husband's house. Quote, the chariots of God are twenty thousand, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them as in Sinai, in the holy place. Because of thy temple at Jerusalem shall kings bring presents unto thee. Princes shall come out of Egypt, Ethiopia shall soon stretch out her hands unto God. To him that rideth upon the heavens of heavens, which were of old, Lo, he doth send out his voice, and that mighty voice. Ascribe ye strength unto God, his excellency is over Israel, and his strength is in the clouds. O God, thou art terrible in thy holy places. The God of Israel is he that giveth strength and power unto his people. Blessed be God. End quote. Psalm 68, verses 17, 29, 31, and 33 to 35. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 2, 3, and 6. Quote, Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. End quote. Quote, and one cried unto another, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. End quote. Quote, then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. End quote. The seraphim. The description of the face and feet of the seraphim imply human form, but there is no other reference in the Bible where they are designated as God's ministering angels. The description of two pairs of wings covering the lower part of their bodies compare with the Hebrew word kanath, skirt, which in its literal rendering is wing, and pertains to the loose flowing outer garment worn in the east, possibly at a wedding. Nevertheless, the seraphim are the highest order of the angelic creation. 
The cherubim, a lesser order of angels, were seen below the seraphim over the invisible being hidden in fire and smoke. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 4. Elsewhere in the Bible, seraphim, seraph, refer to the fiery, rapidly moving, as flying, serpents that bit the murmurers against Moses in the wilderness. These serpents were instruments of God's appointment to discipline, heal, and deliver Israel from rebellion against divine authority. Seraphim, in Hebrew, is the plural of seraph, serpent, seraph, burning one, from seraph to burn. Seraph is rendered fiery, referring to the brazen serpent made by Moses in the wilderness, a symbol of deliverance to those bitten by poisonous snakes because of their rebellion against God's servant. Quote, the Hebrew seraph, in the combination seraph mi ofeth, is rendered flying serpent. The combination of nakash seraph is translated fiery serpent brazen. End quote. Bible Dictionary under Seraphim The Messiah refers to the brazen serpent of Moses in the wilderness as a symbol of his sacrifice for the healing and deliverance of Israel. Quote, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have eternal life. End quote. John 3, verses 14 and 15. In correcting their behavior, God gave them another opportunity to respect his appointed servant. Quote, and the Lord said unto him, Moses, What is in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand, and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand, and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. End quote. Exodus chapter 4, verses 2 to 4. God's people symbolized as serpents. The rod of Moses was a symbol of God's power, given to his servant whom he instructed to give a message of deliverance to his people enslaved by the Egyptians, and which was to make of them symbolic serpents, wise and bold, running away from nothing pertaining to their duty in hearing the voice of God through Moses. For every true representation of God's dealing with his servants, Satan brings a counterfeit, as in the case of the Egyptian serpents, which were swallowed up by the rod of God in Moses' hand. Quote, and the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. End quote. Exodus chapter 7 verse 1. With this graphic illustration of God's serpents and their counterfeits, one could easily see God's true people symbolized as serpents, seraphim quick to hear and to obey his voice through his prophet invested with the spirit of prophecy. God commanded Moses to make a brazen serpent, and Moses commanded the children of Israel to look upon it and be healed. Those who followed Moses' instruction lived, and the others died. A simple lesson in obedience to the voice of God through his servant, Moses. If the meek and lowly Messiah was symbolized by the brazen, fiery serpent in the wilderness which Moses raised up for the children of Israel to look upon and be healed from the bites of the fiery serpents, then God's people could be symbolized as serpents, that is, rods of gods, symbolized as serpents. It was through an act of faith in God's word through Moses that the people were healed, though they did not see that the brazen serpent represented the invisible God, the life-giver. The divine presence, Shekinah glory, Holy Spirit, and the Messiah were both represented in the pillar of cloud by day and the fire by night. Likewise, the flying serpent reflected the two intercessory beings of heavenly origin as fiery seraphim. To summarize, a close inspection of Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1 would lead one to conclude that the Lord and his train represent two divine beings engaged in bringing forth the remnant of Israel, the holy seed from the stock of Jesse. At least two persons of the Godhead appeared to Isaiah with a message of destruction for the wicked and deliverance of those obedient to God's voice through his prophet. 
two divine beings speaking as one. Two voices speaking the same thing as one voice of God. As in the earthly realm, quote, the woman, skirt, is the glory of the man, end quote, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 7, just so in the heavenly, the Holy Spirit, divine presence, is the glory of the Lord, the knowledge of whom is to fill not only the temple as in former days, but the whole earth as well. Complete restoration. The creators of heaven and earth have ever been working in each generation of mankind to recover their lost race through the Spirit's prophetic agents, the prophets, David, Jeremiah, and finally through the Messiah, whose new name shall be the branch. Zechariah chapter 6 verse 12, Isaiah chapter 11 verse 1, Revelation chapter 3 verse 12, and Isaiah chapter 62 verse 2, who is to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem for their dwelling place on earth, a place to prepare people for translation to heaven. Those who have died will be raised to be taken before the throne of God with the living who shall never die. Quote, Thus saith the Lord God, In the day that I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquities, I will also cause you to dwell in the cities, and the wastes shall be builded, and the desolate land shall be tilled, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that passed by. And they shall say, This land that was desolate is become like the garden of Eden, and the waste and desolate and ruined cities are become fenced and inhabited. Then the heathen that are left around about you shall know that I, the Lord, build the ruined cities and plant that that was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. Thus saith the Lord God, I will yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel to do it for them. End quote. Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 33 to 37. Quote. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the cankerworm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, the praise of the name of the Lord your God, that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed, and ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and that my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward, that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. End quote. Joel chapter 2 verses 23 to 29. Quote, and it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea and half of them toward the hinder sea. In summer and in winter shall it be. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. And men shall dwell in it and there shall be no more utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. End quote. Zechariah chapter 14, verses 8, 9, 11, and 16. What a great hope for the present earth's inhabitants! beset on every side with Satan's destructive efforts to erase God's image in earth and themselves. What a glorious restoration is coming on the authority of the sure word of prophecy. Quote, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. End quote. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 19. As an encouragement to the children of Adam and Eve, Enoch was taken to heaven in the divine chariot, the Merkaba. He was translated without seeing death, a type of those who, in the final restoration, will ascend in the cloudy chariot, crying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, in joy and gratitude for the redemption of their bodies from death to live eternally in God's divine presence 
before the Merkaba throne of the majesties of heaven. A message of comfort like that of Isaiah 6 came to God's people scattered throughout the world in 1977 when a vision was given to a servant of God of the seraph of Isaiah chapter 6 verses 6 and 7, a shimmering silver angel on the background of thousands of silvery feathered seraphim coming to earth to do a special work for the redemption of the people of God and to prepare them for translation without death. To be continued in part two. Spirit Wings, Words and Music by Claire Cloninger and Michael Foster. Some birds live in cages, they sing a quiet song, and like them I could sing for only you, but Lord your love released me to sing a different song, and soar above the captive life I knew. Chorus. Spirit Wings, you lift me over the earth-bound things, and like a bird my heart is, flying free. I'm soaring on the song your spirit brings. O Lord of all, you let me see a vision of your majesty. You lift me up and carry me on your spirit wings. Now when my life confines me, I just look to you. And soon my heart is soaring high above. Troubles look much smaller from your point of view. Lifted up on spirit wings of love. Chorus repeated. Used with permission from copyright 1982 by Word Music, a division of Word, Inc. ASCAP. All rights reserved. Quote, And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire, and horses of fire, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. End quote. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11. Faithful Elijah was caught up to heaven in a glorious chariot of fire. He is a representative of those who will be translated without dying when Christ comes.